Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> let me just begin. So, it's when the body says no. Yes. So, this is based on my medical work uh, as a family doctor and also working in palliative care. That means working with people who are dying. And I began to notice that the people who got sick, it wasn't accidental. In other words, me medical practice looks on most diseases as kind of unexplainable. We call it idiopathic, which means we don't know what causes it. So if we look at autoimmune diseases like systemic lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma or chronic fatigue or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or chronic psoriasis, chronic eczema uh, or malignancy, most of the time we don't think we know what causes it. Now sometimes when it comes to cancer we'll find a specific cause, like there's a strong link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Um, so we think we know the cause, but most of the time we say we just don't know what causes it. Now even when it comes to lung cancer, it's very interesting. We have to be very careful about how we think about things. If we say that smoking causes lung cancer, that's not accurate. Because if smoking caused lung cancer, then every time somebody smoked, they should get lung cancer. If, if A causes B, then every time you see A, you should see B. If every time you see A, you don't see B, then A can't be the cause of B. It might be a contributing, a contributing cause, but it can't be the cause. <coughs> and I think in medicine, we have to be very careful at saying that any one thing causes something else. Probably the diseases <coughs> have multiple contributions. <coughs> For example, with lung cancer, it's true that 95% of people who get lung cancer are smokers. But it's not true that every smoker gets lung cancer. So there may be other factors that are contributing to it. Now, as a family physician, I had an advantage over my specialist colleagues. They, they knew a lot more about specific things than I did. But they didn't know the people before they got sick. By the time a specialist sees a person, they've already been diagnosed. At least their illness has been largely identified. But as a family doctor, I got to see people before they got sick. And not only did I get to see them before they got sick, I got to see them in the context of their families and they knew their multi-generational histories. So I had a much broader view of who got sick and who didn't. And I began to notice that there are certain patterns to people who get ill. And I'll tell you about those patterns in a moment. And I noticed the same things in palliative care, that the people who are dying of chronic illness and often malignancy, they had certain personality traits. Now, the idea that personality traits contribute to illness is very strange to the common medical mind. Even though, historically, this has always been observed. So way back to, going back to uh, ancient times, physicians were already beginning to notice the relationship between the emotional factors and the physiology of illness. As a matter of fact, Socrates, uh, 2,400 years ago, quoted a doctor who said that the problem of the doctors of today is they separate the mind from the body. He said that the problem of the doctors of today, 2,400 years ago, was that they separate the mind from the body. Now, if you take an illness like multiple sclerosis, for example, which is an autoimmune disease, autoimmune means that the immune system attacks the body itself. It's as if um, the Slovenian army invaded Slovenia with hostile intent. <coughs> the system <coughs> excuse me, that's meant to protect the body actually attacks it. That's autoimmune disease. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition. 
where the immune system attacks the nervous system. Now the first person to describe multiple sclerosis was Jean-Martin Charcot, a French neurologist in the 19th century. And he said that this was a disease caused by stress. The New York Times six months ago had a big article about big discovery. An American uh, physician did some research and he found that women with breast cancer who are depressed have a much poorer prognosis. In other words, that the emotions play a big role in the unfolding of the malignancy. This is big news, except it wasn't. Because in 1870, there was a British surgeon called James Paget. There, 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 there was a British surgeon called, uh, I'm sorry, I can't take that call. A, a British surgeon called James Paget, who said that breast cancer is related to women's emotions and depression. 1870. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. There's a great Canadian doctor, one of the greatest medical teachers of all time. His name was Sir William Osler. He worked in the 19th century. He worked in the United States, in Canada, and also in Britain. And he said in 1890, that rheumatoid arthritis is caused by long-term worry and stress. Now these pioneers had no research and there's no physiological scientific understanding of how these emotional states precipitated these illnesses, but they saw what they saw. Since those days, since Charcot and since Osler and since uh, James Paget, there's been a lot of research, decades of research, detailed research, showing the relationship between emotions and physiology, <coughs> excuse me, and even showing the physiological pathways connecting physiology and emotions. In 1938, there was a very famous doctor <coughs> at Harvard University he was a Hungarian from Transylvania. His name was Soma Weiss. And Soma Weiss it was so respected at Harvard that to this day, every year at Harvard University, they have a day named after him, a research day in his honor. And in 1938, Soma Weiss said to a medical school class that emotional factors are at least as important in the causation of illness as physiological factors, and they must be at least as important in the treatment. Now this lecture <clears throat> that he gave to medical students was published in the Journal of the medical, American Medical Association in 1940. You can still find it in the libraries. This is at Harvard, <clears throat> where they still remember him. Now this is what's amazing. Three years ago, when I was writing my new book, which is called The Myth of Normal, which has been published in North America and Romania, Hungary, it's, it's going to be published all over the world. I was talking to a doctor at Harvard. This doctor is Dr. Jeff Rediger. He's the head of a department at Harvard University at one of the hospitals. And he told me that to this day, to talk about mind-body health, or mind-body medicine at Harvard is to jeopardize your career. So this is 80 years after Somerweis made that statement, published in the Journal of American, American Medical Association, and to this day, it's still risky for doctors to talk about mind-body medicine. There's a real, what I'm saying, and here's what's funny about it, I wouldn't say funny, tragic about it, is that since Osler and Charcot and Paget and since 1938, when Soma Weiss made this statement that we've had decades of elegant, beautiful research showing the mind-body unity, how emotions affect physiology. And this information is not taught in the medical schools. 
I doubt very much that it's taught in the medical schools in Slovenia. Maybe it is, and maybe I'm wrong. But anywhere else I've looked, in Hungary, in Romania, where I've just visited two weeks ago, in England, in Canada, United States, in Western Europe, this information is not brought to the attention of medical students. Therapists and psychologists who work with people, they tend to be much more aware of these patterns than the medical doctors are. So, when I began to notice these patterns, I had no background. Nobody in medical school talked to me about this stuff. I just couldn't help noticing what I was noticing. So what did I notice? I noticed that the people who developed chronic illness had certain personality traits. What were these traits? Well, the first trait was um, illustrated by a newspaper article, which I don't have in front of me right now, but I could find it on my computer, but I'll quote it for you. It was a woman diagnosed with breast cancer, and she wrote an article for Canadian newspaper about her diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> her uh, husband had a wife before, and the first wife died of breast cancer. And now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with breast cancer. And she, she says, the doctor tells me that, that my lump is small and, mon and not in my lymph nodes, not like that of my husband's first wife. So she, she says, you won't die, she sa he says. And the woman says, but I'm worried about my husband. I'm afraid I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice here? She's the one diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness. She might have to undergo chemotherapy and radiation, surgery. And her first and automatic thought is, how will I support my husband? So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of other people while ignoring your own is was, in my experience, a significant risk factor for illness. What I didn't know when I began to notice these patterns in the, 18, in the 1980s as a family physician is that these patterns had been researched already and these have been noticed and studied and documented. But again, nobody told me about them. Now, the second characteristic of people who get ill chronically is a compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility rather than the needs of the self and the authentic self. Now, identification means, <coughs> excuse me, is a Latin word, idem, which means the same, and fochera, to make. So when you identify with something, you make yourself the same as. So if I identify with my role as a doctor, then how I feel about myself depends on how I'm doing as a doctor. It doesn't depend on my needs, my authentic being, it, it depends on my role. And then I'm going to do everything to fulfill my role, no matter what the impact on me is. So that's what I mean by identification. So that's the second characteristic, rigid compulsive identification with duty, role, and responsibility. Now, the third characteristic is crucial, and it has to do with anger. I noticed that a lot of the people that develop chronic illness are very, very nice people. And there's an interesting condition called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. In Britain, it's known as motor neuron disease. And what it is, is a degeneration of the nerves that move the muscles of the limbs. So people become paralyzed. Once you get the disease, you usually, your prognosis is usually five years, maybe up to 10 years, often very much less. And we say we don't know what causes it. Now, the, the neurologists who work with these ALS patients, they always say how nice these people are. In, there was a congress in München, Munich, Germany, uh, in the 1980s or 90s, 
where two American neurologists, <coughs> excuse me, from the Cleveland Clinic presented a paper. And in this paper, they said that when people come to their clinic for diagnosis, before they see the neurologist, they have a electrical testing of their nerves, which is called electrodiagnostic testing. The technicians who perform the tests will predict who will have ALS and who will not, based on how nice they are. And they'll write, I'm afraid this person has ALS, she's too nice. Or this person can't have ALS, he's not nice enough. And these neurologists presented this paper in Munich, and I asked one of them he, from the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, well, when you presented this paper to your colleagues, what did they say? They said, we all noticed the same things, we just don't understand it. And there was another survey of neurologists more recently where they asked neurologists what they thought of the ALS patients, and they all said they're extraordinarily nice. Now, what this extraordinary nice list is really all about is actually the repression of healthy aggression and healthy anger. So people that repress their healthy anger are at higher risk for malignancy and higher risk for autoimmune disease. So I always worry about the people that are very nice. Now there are two, re two reasons why a person could be very nice and very kind. One is good, the other is not so good. The good reason to be kind is that you're grounded, you're fulfilled, you're spiritually aware, and you're just full of kindness, because that's your nature. But you're not repressing anything. That's a good way to be nice. But the other way to be nice is when you're repressed, your healthy anger, so you're not even aware that you're angered. You're just always trying to please everybody. Always trying to be nice to everybody, compulsively. And that's the dangerous kind. And I'll talk to you in a moment about why people become that way. But that's the third characteristic. Now, let me quickly say why the repression of anger is such a risk. Because what is healthy anger? Healthy anger is very simply a boundary defense. Healthy anger says, you're in my space, get out. Now, in our brains, we have circuits for many emotions. One of the emotions that we have circuits for, neurological pathways, systems, designated for, is anger. And we share that with other animals. Anger is necessary for survival. Anger is a boundary defense. Again, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. It protects your boundaries. Now ask yourself a simple question. So the, so the role of the emotions in general, basically, is to allow in that which is healthy and nourishing and welcome and loving and to keep out what is dangerous and toxic. That's the role of the emotions. What's the role of the immune system? It's the same thing. It's to keep out what is toxic and dangerous, like you know, on viruses or toxins, destroy them, destroy malignant cells, that it doesn't look like the real self. But to let in nutrients and vitamins and, <coughs> excuse me, healthy bacteria. The immune system and the emotional system have the same role. As I'll tell you in a little while, not only do they have the same role, they are the same system. So when you're repressing healthy anger, you're also suppressing the immune system, as we know, physiologically. So that's the third characteristic. The fourth characteristic of people with chronic conditions are two fatal beliefs. They believe, number one, that they're responsible for what the people feel. And number two, that they must never disappoint anybody. These are the characteristics that I noticed in people who were chronically ill. Now, before I go on, I need to deal with a very important question. Are we blaming people for their diseases? Are we saying that you caused your illness? 
Well, the answer is yes. We're saying that certain personality traits contribute to the onset of your illness significantly. But are we blaming you? No, we're not blaming anybody. Why are we not blaming anybody? Because nobody does these things deliberately. These things, these personality traits are the outcomes of childhood programming, childhood trauma, and they're unconscious. And you cannot blame people for unconscious adoptive patterns that later on create problems for them. So what are these, how do these traits come about then? Well, have you ever met a one-day-old baby that suppresses their anger? Have you ever met a one-day-old baby that doesn't express their emotions? Have you ever met a one-day-old baby that is worried about meeting the needs of other people rather than their own? Of course not. So these are not automatic, natural parts of our personality. We develop them. But why have we developed them? It comes down to this. Children have two fundamental, important needs. <clears throat> One is for attachment. Attachment is simply a gravitational force that pulls two bodies together. So gravitation itself is an attachment force. It pulls the earth towards me, and it pulls me towards the earth. We don't have to think about it. It's just there. In the emotional realm, attachment also pulls two bodies together <clears throat> for the sake of being taken care of, or for the sake of taking care of the other. So parents <clears throat> have an attachment drive that wants them to take care of the infant. That's built into the parental brain. That's another brain circuit that we have, is for caring. <coughs> Excuse me. The reason I have a bit of a cough is my book came out six weeks ago and I've been talking nonstop for six weeks and my voice is uh, saying no to all this talking. But, um, so we have this need for attachment. And without that attachment drive, the infant doesn't survive. Because the human infant is the most helpless, the most dependent, the most uh, immature of any creature uh, in, in the mammalian universe. So without attachment, we just don't survive. It's that simple. Of course, attachment is important for human beings throughout our lives. Loneliness, never mind for infants, but for adults, is a significant risk factor. Severe loneliness is as much of a risk factor for early death and illness as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Because we need each other. That's our nature. So attachment is important throughout the lifetime, but it's never more important than in infancy and early childhood. So that's one need that we have. But we have another need as well, which is what I call authenticity. Now authenticity comes from the word auto, the Greek word, auto, the self. So, authenticity means being connected to ourselves, to our emotions, and to our bodies. Why is that important? For millions of years, <clears throat> and hundreds of thousands of years, we evolved, developed, and lived out in nature. Even our own species, which has been on the earth for about 150, 200,000 years, until 12,000 years ago, all of us lived out in nature in small band hunter-gatherer groups. Now, just how long does any creature, any animal, including human beings, survive in nature if you're not connected to your gut feelings? You don't, you die. Now, let me ask you a question. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, okay? If the answer is yes. Raise your hand if you've ever had the experience of having a strong gut feeling about something and you ignored it and you were sorry afterwards. Just raise your hand if you've had that experience. I see most of the hands up. You know what you just told me? You told me the, ch the story of your childhood. 
because as I said, as I said earlier, there's never been an infant, a one-day-old infant, that ignores their gut feelings. So something happened. You know what happened? What happened was, is that at some point in your family of origin, you got the message that if you're being authentically yourself, you were not acceptable to your parents and to your families and to your culture. Because maybe you were angry, but maybe <clears throat> your parents couldn't accept the fact that you're angry. And they gave you the message, if you're angry, we don't like you. They even, maybe even punished you for it. Maybe they followed the advice of some very famous psychologists who tell parents that angry children should be made to sit by themselves till they come back to normal. But what message does the child get? The message the child gets is, I'm not acceptable with my full emotions. Therefore, to maintain my attachment relationship, I have to suppress my emotions. And when you do, you get disconnected from yourself. And when you get disconnected from yourself, you can no longer protect yourself. And you're going to take on all kinds of stress. So these character traits that I described, they're not anybody's natural self. They're inauthentic in the sense that we developed them because we gave up our authenticity. We gave up our authenticity for them because we had the need to attach. And unfortunately, in modern society, too many children are in a position of having to make this unconscious but very um, tragic decision. Give up my true self in order to belong to the family, to the culture, to society. And then we suppress our real selves. Now that suppression of the real self then leads to mental health conditions and to, and to disease. Now, then there's the question of trauma. Um, now trauma, of course, it's another Greek word, it means wound. And you can wound kids, it's a psychological wound that leaves a long-term imprint. You can wound kids in two, day, two ways. Number one, you can wound them by doing bad things to them. Physical, sexual, emotional abuse. And we know that the more physical, sexual, emotional abuse children undergo, the higher the risk for cancer, the higher the risk for mental health problems, the higher the risk for addiction, and the higher the risk for autoimmune disease. Why? Well, if you take a five-year-old, a six-year-old, who's being sexually abused, their natural emotion would be rage. Can they express, can they afford to be angry though? They can't. If they express their rage, they're going to be even more hurt. So in order to survive, they have to suppress their rage. But the problem, <coughs> excuse me, the problem with not even suppress it, but repress it so they're not even aware of it. The problem with these childhood adaptations is that they're unconscious, as you know. Now, in Slovenia, it get, as it does in Eastern Europe, it gets pretty cold in the winter time. You adapt to it. You put on warm clothing, and then you're okay. But if in the summertime you're still wearing that same warm clothing, it would kill you. So the adaptation that was designed for one setting, and is beneficial, necessary, is harmful in another setting. And it's the same with these childhood emotional adaptations. They help the child survive. They're not mistakes. They're actually part of the genius of the organism to promote survival. But the same adaptations become sources of illness later on. And that's the problem. Now, I'll say a few more things about the physiology and then I'll give you the good news and then I'll stop talking. The physiology is very simple. We now know that human beings are biopsychosocial creatures. And that means that the biology of a human being is affected by their emotional, psychological relationships 
and by their social relationships. So that scientifically, it's totally incorrect to separate the mind from the body. So those great pioneers like Charcot and Osler and Paget, who I quoted to you, and, and Soma Weiss, they just saw the unity of emotions and physiology, the mind and the body. Now we have the whole science to prove that. That science is called psychoneuroimmunology, that studies the connections between the immune system, the nervous system, the hormonal apparatus, and the emotional system. In fact, even to say that the hormonal system and the emotional system and the nervous system um, are connected is wrong. They're not connected. Because even to say that they're connected implies that they're different units connected. They're not. They're one system. Different manifestations, different aspects of the same system. So whatever happens emotionally, happens hormonally, happens in the nervous system, happens in the immune system. Now, stress, in the short term, is just a response to a threat. So if I were to threaten you right now somehow, if I could, you'd be stressed, which is good, because you'd have your adrenal, adrenal gland on top of your kidneys would release adrenaline and cortisol, and these are the stress hormones, and these, they would give you more strength and more speed, elevate your blood sugar so you'd have more energy, you could escape or fight back. That's good. In the short term, that's good. In the long term, those same stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, elevate your blood pressure, narrow your blood vessels, increase the risk of heart disease and strokes, suppress your immune system, ulcerate your intestines, put fat on your belly, increase the risk of heart disease, thin your bones, and make you depressed. And these people with these character traits that I told you about, those four traits I told you about, they're creating stress for themselves all the time. They don't mean to, they don't realize it, but it's very stressful to have to repress your anger. It's very stressful to be always taking on the emotional needs of others and ignoring your own. It's very stressful to be always worried about what other people think and always trying to avoid disappointing them. So that's the physiology of it. I mean, I can say more about the physiology if you want, but in a nutshell, that it, it, it has to do with the simple fact that mind and body, from the scientific perspective, are inseparable. And all that's inseparable from a social context. So, for example, in North America, um, where there's a lot of racism, um, in my country, in Canada, indigenous women, these are the Aboriginal population, horribly treated throughout history. I don't know how much you know about it, but the Pope just came to Canada to apologize for how the church treated the native people. These children for over 100 years were abducted from their parents, forced to go into residential schools run by the church, where they were physically, emotionally, sexually abused, beaten, their spiritual ways were mocked and destroyed. The result is that they have high rates of addiction, mental illness, suicide, and when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis, if you're an indigenous woman in Canada, your risk of having rheumatoid arthritis is six times greater, six times greater than that of anybody else. If you're an American woman, black woman, the more experience of racism you experience, the greater the risk of asthma. And I could go on. Women in general have much more risk of autoimmune disease than men do. 70 or 80 percent of autoimmune disease happens to women. And everybody says, we don't know what causes it. We don't know what causes it only because we're not looking at the mind-body unity. Because those characteristics of emotionally looking after others while ignoring your own needs, identification with your role, repressing your healthy anger, being responsible for what other people feel and not disappointing anybody. Which gender is culturally programmed to be that way under a patriarchal system? 
it's the female gender, it's women. That's why women have more autoimmune disease. Now, <clears throat> again, these are facts that the average physician never hears anything about in medical school, which is just astonishing. And the average medical student never gets a single lecture on trauma, if you can believe it, despite all the evidence linking trauma and physical and mental illness. I mean, so the gap between the science and medical practice is incredible. Now, here's the good news. The good news is <clears throat> that if people can recognize these patterns in themselves, and if you as therapists and psychologists and counselors can help them recognize these patterns, they can actually do a lot better with their rheumatoid arthritis, with their multiple sclerosis. I know all kinds of people that used to be on medications, and they were told by the doctors that they had to be on medications for the rest of their lives. And they're not. And they're perfectly okay. Despite the diagnosis of systemic lupus, despite the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, despite the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, they are not on medications and they're fine because they've learned to listen to their disease. <clears throat> they've learned to use the disease as a teacher. So when they've had a flare-up, they've asked themselves, oh, how did I stress myself? How was I suppressing myself? What was I not dealing with in my life? And the more they realize that, the more they allow the, teacher, the disease to teach them, the better they got. Now, I'm not the only one who noticed these things, by the way. I could give you all kinds of other examples. Even with ALS, there are people that recover, which is unbelievable what they do. Nobody can understand it. Well, I think it has to do with, they reconnected with themselves in some serious ways. And if you take a condition like ALS, which is, again, the very famous example that's known to the whole world is the British physicist Stephen Hawking, who, when he was 20 years old, he was diagnosed with ALS, and he was given two years to live. He died 55 years later, having become the world's most famous physicist. So maybe we should tell ourselves that maybe we don't know everything. Maybe there are things that happen to the physiology that really has to do with people's emotions and their relationship to themselves. Because we tend to assume that diseases have a life of their own. That once you have AMS or ALS, it's just got a life of its own. It's going to do its own thing. But you know what? That's just one way to look at it. So to say that somebody has rheumatoid arthritis is to make an assumption. It's, the assumption is, is that there's this thing called rheumatoid arthritis, then there's me, and I have this thing. But this thing has got nothing to do with me. It's got its own nature. It's going to do what it's going to do. But here's the thing. I have a cell phone. See, I have a cell phone. I can put it down, pick it up, destroy it, give it away, keep it. But it's not me. Its nature has nothing to do with my nature. But is that true about multiple sclerosis? Is that true about cancer? Is that true about any illness, depression, anything? That it's got its life of its own? No, it's not true. What is true is that these are processes that inflammation in the body, such as many of these conditions represent, is a process in the body. And in, we know that inflammation is triggered by stress and by trauma. And the more we deal with the trauma and the stress, the less inflammation there may be. So if we see these conditions not as things in themselves, but as processes that manifest our lives, it also means that if we change our lives, if we connect to our authentic selves, we can change the process. That's, I think, what I wanted to tell you. I'll just take any comments or questions that you may have.
Što? Hvala sam. Govanja. Can I go first? Can you hear me? Uh, listen, I have a question. I have a question regarding... question regarding uh, trauma response and stress response. How do you define it? Is it the same or is it a different response in the body? Thank you. Well, the two are very much connected, um, <clears throat> but let's make the distinction here. So trauma is, um, as I said before, it's, it's a wound, it's a psychological wound. And um, The, the impacts of trauma is, um, by the way, let me just make this really clear here. And in my new book, The Myth of Normal, I spend a chapter on this. Trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. So trauma is not the fact that you had to live through a war, or trauma is not that you were abused or that your parent died, that's not the trauma. That's a traumatic event. The trauma is the wound that you suffered as a result. And the, the effects of trauma, that's, that's the good news, by the way, <clears throat> because if trauma, like for example, I mean, I've talked about my own traumatic history. I was born in Budapest in January 1944 to Jewish mother, two months before the Nazis occupied Hungary. So our family had many terrible things happening, and I had some very difficult times as a as a as an infant. But that wasn't a trauma; that was the traumatic event. That's a good thing, because if the trauma was what happened to me, there's nothing I can do about it. It happened. It'll never not have happened. But if the trauma is what happened inside me, what I came to believe about myself, that I wasn't lovable or wanted, that can heal any time. So let's make that distinction. That trauma is not what happens to you, it's what happens inside you. That's the first point. The second point is that trauma then disconnects you from your body because um, <clears throat> to stay connected is too painful. So the disconnection is adaptive. It's got a survival function, but later on, that same adaption, adaptation causes problems. If you disconnect them from your body, you can't protect yourself. So trauma is these long-term wounds. What happens then is that those traumatic wounds create a lot of stress in your life later on. So for example, and I, and I talked about this before, if you repress your healthy anger, that's the traumatic imprint. But that traumatic imprint is going to create a lot of stress in your life because you won't be able to protect yourself. It means you put up with being treated in ways that are really not good for you. And that creates a lot of stress. So the connection that I would make is that the traumatic imprint creates stress later on. And it's that stress then that leads to illness. I hope that's clear. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for today. I have high respect for you and your work. Uh, can you please tell me, tell us something about if it happens that a person does get sick, 
How does one start to perhaps change the process? What is something they first must do? Is it that we need to start to pay attention to our needs and release healthy anger or all the characters that you just said? Or what can one do actually when that situation of illness comes? Okay. Well, thank you. Ideally, here's what happens. <clears throat> here's the problem. Let me ask you all a question, okay? Um, again, I'll ask for a show of hands here. So, if in the last 10 years you have been to a neurologist or a dermatologist or a gastroenterologist or a rheumatologist or immunologist, any kind of an ologist, just raise your hand, okay? Okay, thank you. Now, raise your hand if that specialist asks you about trauma in your childhood. Anybody? I don't see any hands. Raise your hand if they asked you about stress in your life. I don't see, do I see one or two hands? Raise your hand if they asked you about how you feel about your work. Okay, raise your hand if they asked you about how you feel about yourself as a human being, if you like yourself. Nobody. Okay. Those questions that they didn't ask you, in, mo in the vast majority of cases, not in every case, but in the vast majority of cases, have everything to do with why you went to the doctor in the first place. Because they're all to do with stress that you weren't dealing with, caused by trauma that you hadn't realized. Now, ideally, what would happen when somebody got a, diag got a diagnosis? They, they got the medical help they needed. I'm, I'm a medical doctor. I'm not against medicine. And modern medicine has many miracles and great achievements to its credit. But we have this terrible separation of mind and body. So when somebody got sick, if they were advised, okay, look, you got this physical illness, but that physical illness is not disconnected from your life. It's not disconnected from your emotions. And <clears throat> you could actually learn from the disease about to reconnect with yourself. And if you did that, that could have a very positive impact on your physical health. Most people would be very happy to hear that message. It has to be said in a way that doesn't blame the patients. I emphasized that earlier. <coughs> but, but if you came to a doctor, what would you rather be told? You've got this thing called multiple sclerosis. There's this thing called multiple sclerosis. You've got it. You're going to have it for the rest of your life. Here's what it's going to do. And all we can do is give you medications for the rest of your life. And we have no idea what causes it. Or would you rather hear, there's this process of inflammation going on in your body, in this case, in your nervous system. That inflammation may have a lot to do with your childhood history. By the way, there's a lot of evidence for that and your traumas and your stress. And if we help you deal with your stresses, and especially if we help to reconnect you or help you reconnect to your authentic self so that you actually listen to your gut feelings and you learn how to say no, then your condition can get better. Which message would most people rather hear? And so where do you begin? I tell you where I begin. I ask people a very simple question. Where do you have trouble saying no in your life? And that usually shows up in two areas, in work and in personal relationships. People have chronic trouble saying no. <coughs> Where do you have trouble saying no? Well, usually in their marriage or with their friends and or on the job. And the second question I ask them is, what is the impact on you of your difficulty saying no? If we had the time, if I was there in person, I would actually do this exercise with you. And you might actually try it with each other later on today. Just sit down and have a conversation. Just find one person to talk with and ask them a question. Where do you have trouble saying no? And just listen for five minutes and then change it around and have the other person ask you, where do you have trouble saying no? You're going to discover a lot about yourself. In other words, find out in your life 
where you have trouble being yourself. When I mean where you have trouble saying no, I mean where there's a no that wants to be said, but you're not saying it. Because you're afraid that they won't like you. You're afraid to disappoint somebody. Because if I say no, I'm a bad person. All these stories that we tell ourselves, that has nothing to do with reality, it has to do with childhood. So just begin with that. Just begin with, where am I not being myself? And if the disease flares up, how was I stressing myself? So th th this is where I would begin. Um, in my new book, The Myth of Normal, I explain this in much greater detail than I do in my book, When the Body Says No. And the reason for that is I wrote When the Body Says No, which I, you know, I still, you know, it's, I think it's full of great information and I still completely stand by everything I said. But I know a little bit more about healing now than I did when I wrote that book 20 years ago. Can I ask the next question? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for everything that I've learned today. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, since uh, you told that mind and body were, I mean, doctors were uh, aware that it was connected even in the old Greece, and yeah. this is not the first time that I've heard about it. So what's stopping those information to get to public, to get to medical schools? Would you, th would you say that maybe pharma industry is making its impact here because if we are going to have less physical illness then who are they going to sell drugs to and provide treatments well that's a part of it um that's certainly the part of it but it's not the only part first of all <clears throat> the western mind um since greek time i mean since ancient times has kind of separated the mind from the body but especially when capitalism arose in the 16th, 17th centuries, and there was this great expansion of science and industrialization, this separation of mind and body became almost a religion. So Rene Descartes in the 16th century, 17th century, said, um, <clears throat> I think, therefore I am. In other words, my existence depends on my thinking. That was not accurate. But it became the Western mantra, so that the intellect, separated from the, from the emotions, became the ruler of everything. Now that led to a lot of great scientific advances, hasn't it? I mean, our science since the 17th century has been incredible. But it brought along with it a certain blindness as well. But it's not true that I think, therefore I am. Because when you think of a, a little baby, they don't think. But do they not exist? What about an animal that doesn't think? Do they not exist? You know, the actual reality is, I feel, therefore I am. So the Western mind separated the intellect from the emotions, and therefore necessarily the intellect from the body. And this separation has been going on for hundreds of years. It has only got worse. Because the smarter we got scientifically, the more arrogant we became. And the more we ignored the emotions and the body. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, <clears throat> under a system of... Um, you know, I grew up in uh, communist Eastern Europe, in Hungary. I was 13 years old when Hungarian Revolution broke out in 1956, and that's when we came to Canada. And there was a joke <laughs> in Eastern Europe under communism, uh, which was, what is capitalism? Capitalism, under capitalism, man exploits man. And what is socialism? Under socialism, it's the other way around, you know. So the reality is that in any materialistic system where human beings exploit each other, and I don't care if you call it communism as they did in Eastern Europe or whether you call it capitalism as they call it in the West, it's exploitation of human beings by human beings. You, ha you have to deny the unity of mind and body. 
Because if you didn't, you couldn't treat people the way you do. You just couldn't do what you do to people. So that's the second point. The third point is that the people that go into medical school are very often traumatized people, like me. You know, and, and, and there's all kinds of good reasons to want to be a doctor. But one, but some of the reasons, you know, you want to help humanity. That's wonderful. You want to support health. That's wonderful. But also, for a lot of us, we want to be important. We want to be experts. We want to be respected because we don't respect ourselves enough. In other words, we've been traumatized. But we haven't dealt with our own traumas, have we? And the harder you work and the more you ignore yourself, the more rewards you get. Then, medical school is a very traumatic experience for a lot of people. I don't know what it's like in Slovenia, but I know that in many parts of the world, it's a very traumatic experience. You have to put up a lot of stuff, sleep deprivation, stress, authoritarian leaders. And you put up with it. How are you going to, how are you going to recognize the stresses and traumas of other people? when you haven't dealt with your own. And then what you said, who funds the research? The people that fund the research are the people who make a profit from the research. Who makes a profit from the research? The pharmaceutical companies. So if they can come up with a new antidepressant or a new pill against inflammation, that's wonderful. They're going to make a lot of money. But there's no money to be made in helping people overcome their traumas so their bodies don't get inflamed anymore. There's no money in it. So what you said contributes to it, but it's a much larger context. And finally, um, doctors are very conservative people. It's a very conservative profession. Change is very difficult for them. And, you know, if you've been practicing medicine for 20 years, what are you going to do? Somebody says, you know what? Mind and body are one, and you know, you have, that means I have to change the way I practice. Changing the way you practice, especially when you think you're a big expert, it's very difficult. So there's all these reasons. Thank you. Hello? Okay. So I have a question about autoimmune diseases, more specifically about celiac disease. Um, yeah. Is it also caused by stress or trauma? And if it is, can it be treated? Because I've been told that it's a lifelong disease. Thank you. Everybody's always told that it's a lifelong disease. And what the doctors are talking about is, the doctor should, you know what the doctor should really say if they were really honest about it? They should say, I don't know what causes this, and I can't help you, except to keep the symptoms under control. But they make their ignorance into a religion. So they say, you got this lifelong disease, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, it's not true. When people deal with their emotional patterns, believe me, they can reverse their celiac disease. I've seen it. And, and, of course, you'd expect that. That's what you'd expect. If, scientifically, it's true what I'm saying, and it is true what I'm saying, that mind and body can't be separated, and that stress causes inflammation, which it does, but it also means that the more I, authentic I become, and I say no, and I don't stress myself so much, my body's going to change. Of course it is. So... The doctors are just telling you about their ignorance. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, they know a lot, you know, and, and thank God for that. But they don't know what they don't know. It's not that doctors don't, it's not that doctors think they know everything. It's just that they think that what they don't know is not worth knowing. And they don't realize what they don't know. So, if I understood correctly, the cure is uh, having a stress-free life, or...? Cure? 
Um, healing is um, recognizing where you're not saying no. Well, do you have celiac? Are you somebody with celiac disease? Okay. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Sure. How easy has it been to say no in your life? Very difficult. Yes. Now, do you think as a one-day-old baby you had trouble saying no? I don't think so. <laughs> if somebody tried to feed you something you didn't want to eat, do you think you knew how to say no? Before or now? No, when you were one day old. Oh, no. <laughs> you had no trouble saying no, right? No. no. So, so something happened in your childhood where you had to suppress your no. So, is it okay if I keep asking you questions? Sure. I'm not going to ask you to be specific, but you know I said <clears throat> people have trouble saying no in two major areas in their lives, personal life and professional life. Where do you have trouble saying no? In both cases. Okay. What is the impact on you of not saying no? Well, I didn't think it was a, that I had problems with it until now. <laughs> yeah, but what is the impact on you when you, when you don't say no? When there's a no that wants to be said and oh. you don't say, what is the impact on you? I guess frustration. Okay, frustration. How does that feel in the body, frustration? Um, it depends, maybe anger. Yeah, but how does it feel in the body? Um, I'm not sure right now. <laughs> well, take a moment, okay? Imagine that you're frustrated. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your belly? What's going on in your chest? What's going on in well, your throat? I'm feeling nervous. Okay. Mm. Is there tension there? Yes, definitely tension. Okay. That tension is physical. That's affecting your organs. That's affecting your system. Okay, so the impact of not saying no is that you create a lot of tension inside yourself. Do you see that? Definitely, yes. Okay. Now, the third question is, what is your belief that has you not saying no? If I say no, that then what? Well, I think that I'm going to hurt other people. So what you said yeah. earlier in your, when you were talking, yeah. that um, yeah. I feel kind of responsible for other people's feelings. Right. Okay. <laughs> So, I'm telling you, if you worked with this, your body would get better, okay? That's great news. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And by the way, then I could ask you another question. Where did you learn that if you say no, you're hurting other people? Well, I know where you learned it. You learned it in your family of origin, you know? and. Uh, um, <clears throat> let me ask you one question, one more question. <coughs> Excuse me. Who would you be if you knew how to say no? Who would you be? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I guess well, I don't know. <laughs> well, think about it for a moment. Well, Who would you be? Who would you be? Definitely, I think, more confident. <laughs> a more confident, confident person, yeah. Okay, what else? I would be my true self, right? <laughs> right, right. You're asking me? <laughs> you'd also be free is who you'd be. Yeah. Right now you're not free. You, this is not personal to you. This is true for all of us, you know. But right now you're a puppet. And your strings are pulled by these emotional, traumatic imprints that you developed as a child. You'd be free to be in the present moment, to be yourself. That's how you'd be. That and makes so much sense. Yeah, okay, good. Well, thank you then. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Matia. Uh, 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 my question in, is uh, kind of in the vein of your session with a colleague. Uh, could you please explain a little more about what you think about when you say being yourself? 
and being authentic because uh, okay. uh, as an example of being yourself, you're saying uh, what did you do when you were a day year old child? Yeah. So, so well, uh, oh, very, uh, uh, very much in the past, we stop being authentic selves. Yeah. So, yeah. how to find? What do you do well, with clients <clears throat> and yourself? Okay, and you can well, try it with me. How to find yourself yeah. authentic self? All right. So, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Please. <clears throat> do you know? Do you ever? notice that you're in a conversation or in a situation and you're not being yourself do you ever notice that yeah yeah and who, no who notices it i do who's the you that notices it it's the me who thinks exactly no it's not the me who thinks the youth no no who sense. perceives the, the you and who I thinks can think all kinds of nonsense okay and does often uh, it, you know so who's but who's the one that notices that you're not being authentic? It is me. It's your authentic self. If you didn't have your authentic self, you wouldn't notice that you're not being authentic. So God's is authentic me. So here's what I'm saying. Don't try and find your authentic self, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't try and do that. Just notice when you're not being authentic. That's good. And the person who notices it is the authentic self. Oh. Okay? And so pay, so pay attention to that. And also, ask yourself, don't judge yourself. Like, don't, you know, don't be critical of yourself. I wasn't being authentic, I'm a terrible person. Don't do that. I, I tend to do that. Of course you do. By the way, you don't tend to do it, your mind tends to do it. That's your automatic programming, okay? So what I teach, I teach a course, by the way, for therapists internationally. It's called Compassionate Inquiry. And um, the essence of Compassionate Inquiry is that we're compassionate towards every part of ourselves and the, and the client, and we're just curious, okay? so. The next time you notice that you're not being authentic, instead of being critical, or notice the criticality, I mean, it's going to come up. <clears throat> but instead of identifying with the criticality, ask yourself, hmm, I want to be authentic, but I wasn't. I wonder why I wasn't. What did I believe? What was the belief that keeps me from being authentic? So if you ask yourself that question, what is the belief that keeps you from being authentic? Uh, fear of throwing away, fear of not belonging, mostly. Fear of not belonging. That's what I said earlier. That's the tension between attachment and authenticity. In your childhood, you learned that if I am authentic, I will not be accepted. Now you have a decision to make. Do I want to live from that belief that I developed as a four-year-old or as an adult? Do I have a choice in the matter? And you're going to find that you're not helpless anymore. You're not alone anymore. You're not resourceless anymore. You don't have to keep choosing the attachment over the authenticity. At least you can make a decision about it. So just be conscious. Okay? Very much, thanks. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. I, hi. I'm enjoying this very much, so thank you. Yeah. Um, and I would also like to see if we can even broaden the perspective you gave. And you also a bit touched upon it when you mentioned the exploitation. So when you talk about symptoms, it's clear that it's uh, symptoms of the organismic imbalance, the holistic view you are presenting. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking whether there is even larger dimension to it, that there are also s uh, symptoms of society, so that in fact we can't just reduce everything to an individual, 
And I'm saying this not to take away the responsibility of the individual, but in the neoliberal system, I think the uh, individual is blamed for all the problems and so on. And there is also a danger in going too much in this direction and losing sight of the larger social yeah. view. So I'm curious what, you, what your thoughts are about this. Well, <laughs> thank you for asking, because my new book, which just was published six weeks ago, by the way, it's a bestseller in the United States, in Canada, in Hungary, and Romania. Uh, I think it'll be published in Slovenia, and I'm pretty sure it will be. The title is The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. I'm saying exactly what you're saying, is that you can't separate the individual from the environment, you can't separate the individual from the culture, and that individual disease actually reflects social conditions and social relationships and particularly under neoliberalism you get more autoimmune disease you get more mental illness more addiction more suicide more everything and that's a cultural thing it's not because of some pathology of the individual that's my whole point and that's why i wrote this new book which is going to be published in about 25 languages i think slovenian is going to be one of them i'm not sure anymore i can tell you if i looked on my computer but i t t totally agree with you and what can I say? I just wrote a whole book about it. Thank you. I'm excited about it. I'm going to read it. And the question, of course, is what we can all do together about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a po political question. You know, maybe you should ask Slavoj Žižek or something like that, you know. Um, except I never understand what he's talking about. But uh, the... the uh, um, it's a social question, and, the, and, and these questions are not going to be resolved at the individual level, you know, and um, I think um, Eastern Europe had this very negative experience with what they call socialism, and now you're, everybody is experiencing the joys of capitalism and neoliberalism and increasing loneliness and inequality and so on. We're going to have to come up with something different. But that's a, that's a social question. I have my own points, points of view about it. I have my own particular political perspective, but I'm not going to impose that on, on the, in this conversation. But it is a social question. It goes way beyond the individual person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and I talked about that before to some extent. Like, even if you look at COVID, we think COVID is caused by this virus. Well, it is. But if you looked at who got sick, at least in North America or in Britain, I know the people who are more likely to get sick were the people of color, people of lower socio socioeconomic class, people who are more stressed, people who are more obese. Who are the people who are more obese? They tend to be the poorer people who eat more junk food, who are under more stress. These are social questions. So COVID wasn't just a viral issue. COVID was very much a question of inequality as well. And it's a social question, as you suggest. Hello, uh, Hello. I want to ask something uh, which actually needs some explanation in order to ask. <laughs> Uh, so, um, we in uh, reality therapy uh, pretty much subscribe to what you're saying about body and mind unity. Uh, yeah. But we also um, speak about something uh, which, which we need to create before we create any behavior. So, for instance, uh, if I, uh, or, or if you, if you, for instance, uh, are angry at me for explaining everything, like, you know, using too many words in order to ask the question. Maybe you uh, perceive it as an attack on you, uh, on your authority, on uh, we invited you and so I'm, you know, attacking you. This would uh, perhaps produce some stress, you know, yeah. you will feel frustration. Right. And, yeah, but if you, uh, for instance, uh, interpret it in another way, like uh, this guy is in explaining something, he wants to make a point, he has something to uh, ask, and uh, I'm wondering what he's going to ask. 
maybe the level of stress wouldn't be as high. Exactly. So, so the interpretation of, of the situation, we, uh, we uh, label it a chosen perception. So the chosen perception differs in, in a situation A and situation B, and uh, because the, social, uh, the, the chosen perception differs, uh, the complete behavior and, uh, and the mind and the body is different. So uh, what, what I want to ask you about, about chosen perception, do you have any uh, relatable terms uh, to explain? Do you, do you explain something similar uh, to this? Because yeah. we are going, I, I'm asking this because we are going to uh, discuss uh, uh, what are similarities uh, of reality therapy and your approach uh, in small groups after your uh, lecture here. <laughs> so, I thank see. you. Okay. Well, look, first of all, the only, the only word I would argue with is chosen. Because choice involves consciousness. And when it comes to these interpretations, they're not conscious. They're automatic. So, um, here's what happens. The stress response has three components. There's the external stressor, okay? So in your case, the example that you give is somebody asking a question using a lot of words, okay? That's the external event, okay? Then there's, that's the first part. The last part, the third part, is the physiological reaction, which is maybe I get tense and I get impatient, you know? But in between, and, and that causes stress hormones in my body, that's what you're saying. But in between the external stressor and the physiological stress response is what we call the interpreting system. And the interpreting system is you and I with our particular perceptions. So if I have a poor self-image and I need everybody to respect me and every time somebody goes on a bit too long, I think they're not respecting me. I'm going to respond with stress, just as you suggest. But if, but if I actually think, oh, this person just needs to take a long time, or, they, or maybe this person, when they were a child, they were never listened to, so now they have a big need to be listened to, then, my, then, my physical, then I'm not going to be upset, am I? So the interpretive system is what you call the chosen interpretation, okay? Except it's not chosen. It has to do with how I was programmed in childhood. So that the, the only word that would change is chosen. If it, because again, cho choice, it is chosen unconsciously. So if you add the word unconsciously chosen, I would agree with you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. A hundred percent. That's where we, putting, that's where we agree. <laughs> thank you. Sorry? That's so, where we agree. Also, we we don't say uh, we we take a whole year in order <coughs> to explain that choice actually is the system. Exactly. So, so whatever we produce is actually uh, choice. Choice is just a metaphor for for a, a complete system behaving. And the whole idea of therapy, as far as I'm concerned, is to make people conscious of these choices, so they can actually make conscious deliberate choices yes so, you i know, find and, similarity uh, yeah yeah thank yeah. you yeah exactly okay hi uh well i have one question uh, but uh in last two questions i already got half an answer uh, my question is about uh, uh parent parental responsibility because um as you were speaking and writing about it, uh, most issues come from uh, childhood programming. So parents are crucial ones. Uh, their relationship to, to a child is crucial. Uh, yeah. So if we want to make a change, uh, it's really, really important to, make, uh, to teach people how to make, uh, how to uh, lead uh, different uh, relationships with their kids. But then those kids go to system, kindergarten, schools, etc., etc., where if they um, 
if they're so lucky uh, to still have that authenticity, uh, they will be um, marked and punished by uh, many teachers um, yeah. uh, through their grades, through some measures or ex ex expelling, etc. So many, uh, it happened before, but uh, since the system is not changing that, uh, like uh, medicine as well, educational system is not changing that uh, fast. No. So these kids then are prone to have uh, traumas in that educational system where they won't be accepted authentical as they are. So That's my right. question is very practical. Uh, what to teach those kids? How, how to raise authentic child that can go through system which will not like him because he won't be polite. System won't uh, polite child, right? Yeah, you know, uh, in 1954, 55, I was in grade six in Hungary and the, um, the teacher wrote on my report card that Gabo better watch himself because he keeps inciting his classmates, you know, because I kept arguing with the teacher when I thought things weren't fair, you know. Um, it's a tough question that you're asking because the school system doesn't understand child development. Like the average doctor doesn't learn about human development, but neither does the average teacher. Now, the reality is, is that the human brain develops from in the womb, actually, before birth, into adulthood. And the human brain develops under the impact of the environment, so that it's not genetically programmed. The, the potentials are genetic, but what develops and what doesn't in the human brain depends on the environmental input. And the most important aspect of the environment in promoting the healthy development of the brain is the emotional relationships with the nurturing adults. Now, as we evolved as human beings, as I talked earlier, we lived in small band hunter-gatherer groups when kids were with nurturing adults the whole day. And was, that was a nurturing context. Today, kids are spent most of their time away from their parents, in schools, but the teachers are taught nothing about human development. They're taught nothing about the emotional needs of the child. The role of the teacher is to enforce the dictates of society and to bring up kids that will fit into a system that basically is an exploitive one. That's the role of the schools. And teachers, teachers mean well, but they're not trained to understand what the child really needs. And that means that when the child is being authentic, or just when the child is being troubled, because they're traumatized, that what the teacher sees is a behavior problem. And then their response is try and control the behavior. But trying to control the behavior is not the same as promoting the healthy development of the child. So there's a real contradiction between the needs of the child and the expectations, as you say, of the school system. So how do we support these children? Well, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, but I can tell you, the way you support the child whether you're the parent, whether you're the teacher, whether you're a counselor, whether you're an aunt or an uncle, is to validate the child's feelings. Mm -hmm. And to say, yeah, I get how you feel. And you have every right to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Just validating the child, being empathetic, even if you can't change the child's situation, goes a long way towards promoting that child authenticity. That's a very small answer to a very big question. I could talk about it at much longer, um, you know, uh, extent, but the essence of it is that we need to validate children's emotions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Many thanks for this very interesting and informative presentation. I believe that uh, we all have different experience and question in our minds right now, um, but the time is too short to, to share it 
them all. So I hope that in the future we will uh, have more opportunities to meet you and talk with you in live. So you promise that you are coming to uh, Europe, to Hungary next year. Yeah. In May, yeah. In May. So yeah. let's stay in touch and uh, maybe we can arrange some uh, presentation in life if you agree. I'd love to come to Slovenia. I know what a beautiful country it is. Yeah. Thank you very I, much. I, 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 even, I even forgive you for the of time. Okay? Um, okay. Thank, you. Okay. Right. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you and have successful conference today. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.